Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium for Tuesday, the 9th of March. This is our last program before spring break and uh, more details on uh, speaker two weeks from today in just a few minutes. I'm Kenton Bird and I am the co-coordinator of this series. And you'll see on the screen uh, Dan Buckvich, uh, who's my uh, partner in this long running interdisciplinary series. And I'd also like to thank Kristen McMullen who stepped in to host the program two weeks ago during my absence and gave a, a great uh, uh, overview of the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival. So uh, before uh, introducing today's speaker, I want to tell you a little bit about a program we have going next, uh, uh, actually Thursday of this week, and then the program for two weeks from now. This Wednesday, the 10th of March, tomorrow, uh, the Confluence Lab, along with the departments of journalism and mass media and English, are presenting a documentary film called The New West and the Politics of the Environment. Uh, John Christensen, a journalist and professor at UCLA has uh, produced this film and uh, we'll follow it with a q and A. I I will put the uh, URL into the chat um, so that uh, you can find it if you're interested. It's also on the University Events calendar and today at Idaho. The Tuesday after spring break, March 23rd, our speaker will be Ben Hunter, the Dean of Libraries, who will talk about uh, the economics of scholarly communication or why we're losing access to our own research and what we can do about it. So uh, coming up two weeks from today and um, Dean Hunter is excited to present about some of the strategies uh, for open source journals as opposed to uh, paid publications and uh, some of the ways that the library can be more responsive to the needs of students and faculty. <clears throat> Today's speaker is a visiting scholar at the University of Idaho in UI Extension in Latak County. He earned his PhD in landscape architecture at University Putra, Malaysia. He has worked as a landscape architect and in academia in Iran, Malaysia, and the United States. In his academic life, he has taught uh, various subjects in landscape architecture and conducted research about landfill redevelopment, open space categorization, and water conservation. And his uh, topic today is the importance of social aspects in sustainable landfill redevelopment. And so uh, please welcome Dr. Ashkan Nochian. So you, uh, Thank you so much for your nice introduction. And hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen, but while I'm doing that, I would like to thank Dr. Iris Myers to encourage me to be part of this prestigious event. So, Yeah. Looks As good. Dr. Bird mentioned, uh, my presentation is about importance of social aspects in sustainable landfill redevelopment. Hopefully my presentation little, give you a little bit of information what is happening in other corner of the, our planet. And last but not least, notify us about our responsibility of um, take care of this world since the 
waste stream is one of the major issue all around the world and cause lots of problems. And I prepared my presentation in four uh, sections. The first section, I'm going to just generally uh, discuss what is a landfill and information regarding a landfill. And after that, I'm going to um, discuss about the, the design project I have been involved. And that's maybe give you some information how difficult it is to, to develop a, a landfill. And after that, uh, the main uh, idea of this presentation is about the importance of social aspect. And finally, the idea that I got through this journey, I share with you a little bit of that. What is a landfill? Actually, the definition of a landfill is varies from one country to another, or even maybe from one authority to another. And still, we have a lots of landfill that the people or authority, they call it landfill, but they are open dump site, meaning that they just simply put the waste, trash, garbage there, and some authority just burn them. However, nowadays, because of the awareness of the environmental hazard that landfill can, can affect on environment, many countries and authorities try to develop a modern landfill. According to the United States Environmental Protected Agency, which is APA, a modern landfill are well-engineered facilities designed to receive a specific kind of waste, included municipal solid waste, construction, and demolition divers and hazardous waste. So for example, here in Malaysia, if they want, this is in the US. So when we US talk about landfill, which means a sanitary landfill or engineered landfill. However, in Malaysia still, when they call it landfill, it's like that, it's an open dump site. So because they are just started not long time ago, so they use the term sanitary landfill to refer to this kind of landfill. This kind of landfill <clears throat> designed to collect the, to collect the leachate produced by, from the waste, capture the gas and maybe uh, generate the electric from the gas. And also other issues regarding the, for example, the runoff control, things like that. So for the purpose of this presentation, if I say landfill, which means sanitary landfill. Type of landfills. We can categorize landfill in several ways. For example, based on the engineering design, how they design the landfill. But one of the most common is based on the waste they receive, based on the garbage they receive. And the most common type of landfill nowadays is municipal solid waste landfill, which is many very common because this kind of uh, landfill receive household trash, trashes. After that, we, ha we have industrial waste landfill, which can be construction waste and other type of industrial. Hazardous waste landfill, which are very sensitive landfill, usually the authority make a stronger law and regulation to, for building the land for this kind of landfill for hazardous waste. Because for example, they need to be double layer for collecting the leachate to make sure nothing goes to environment. And agricultural waste landfill. There is new coming type of landfill, for example, they call it green landfills, things like that. They receive the um, organic waste. And of course, in the future, I believe there will be different type of landfill. But so far, this is the most uh, common type of landfill. And among them, municipal solid landfill, which is MSW landfill is a uh, most common one. So for the purpose of this presentation, when I talk about landfill means a sanitary municipal solid waste landfill. 
What's the problem with landfill? To me, uh, still, there are a lots of unknowing things about the problem of landfill. And many scholars mentioned that too. But we can categorize based on our knowledge so far, we can categorize the problem in few groups. One of them is pollution because <clears throat> landfill, whether, <clears throat> whether the landfill is in operation or closed, but it still gen uh, produce greenhouse gas and dust. Dust because of maybe machinery, traffics, and other activities. And this greenhouse usually contains methane and carbon dioxide. It's the main gas and cause nowadays climate changing. So landfill is one of those uh, problems. Water contamination, because as I said, landfill produce leachate here, you can see. So the leachate can goes to the underground or surface water and contaminate them, contaminate soils. Health issue, because there are lots of toxin and also because of vermin. So it could be a serious problem for, for the nearby areas. Noise, noise because of uh, activities over there and maybe some of the animals, lots of animal usually is there using the, the waste. So poison and alter the fauna and flora because yeah, it is hard to control animals. They come and eat and they can just be poisoned and altered. Gas explosion and fire. There are lots of reports saying that the gas explosion happen, especially to those dam sites which are not engineered. Reduce the value of surrounding area. So if the let's say the urban area is nearby the landfill, it can reduce the, for example, the the cost or the of the the houses the the business that affects a lot. So landfill lifespan. So I categorize life, landfill lifespan in five different stages. The first stage is begin with siting and planning a stage. It means that we need to carefully find the right place for the landfill. So lots of consideration should be there. So the distance between the, the source of waste and also the, the land form of the area and also the effect of the landfill with the surrounding area is something that need to be carefully considered. Design a stage where, which de depends on the type of waste and type of landfill must be carefully designed to make sure we can overcome obstacle and problem as much as possible. The construction stage here means the stage that they build the landfill. However, the construction stage is an ongoing work because from the up, right after design, the construction is st start and it goes along the landfill on even after closure which means there is a need for construction, maintenance up to the far, far end of the landfill. However, here construction means this stage. Operation stage is where the landfill receive and collect the waste and work on that. So this is the time of um, operation and closure and post-closure. Closure means because when they design the landfill, they design and operate it based on different cells. It's not they put all the waste and put together. So they like here, if you can see, they make it like a cells and also in different phases. For example, maybe here it would be phase one, next to it phase two. So the closure is start right after each cells capped. So because they cap cells to make sure they can control gas and leach it. So this is closure. And post-closure start 
once the one phase or hold the landfill, just close. No more, no more receiving this waste. So that would be post-closure stage. Post-closure stage could take up to 30 years or even longer. Depends on the type of waste, the weather and conditions, and other factors. So it, uh, it means that the landfill is a long journey, not only to once it closed everything down. No, we have to go long after that. And 30 years is an average, it could be even longer. And many scholars included me, the authority should take care of landfill even longer because as I said, there are lots of unknown things about the landfill and its problems. So the question here, what would be happen once the landfill closed? So some of the landfill are very large and you know the land, the land is scarce, is expensive. So what to do with that? Just leave it like that. There are a few, there are a few category of options. One of them is open space, like a park. Agricultural land use or woodland. Hard end use, hard end use meaning that like buildings, any buildings like shopping malls, housing area, energy generation. So using the landfill for generating energy. Here, in my research, I investigated 96 landfills since 1961 to find out what is the best and most common use of landfill. Before I go through that, I would like to say that nowadays, I mean recently, because the awareness about the problems of landfill are more clear. So a lot of government authorities and countries enforce the law to you to reuse the landfill as open space. But there are still countries that because they have problems with land or maybe there are corruptions, things like that, or maybe the interfere of the private sector, they turn it to another after use options. So among 96, which I uh, investigated, 51 transfer to transfer to open space. So nine to agricultural land use and woodland. This option was in the past, they use it as a pasture, for example, because once they're in the post closure, they usually cap, cap the whole area carefully with one meter up to one meter or three feet of the soil and apply grasses because grasses um, helps to prevent erosion because landfill usually is a, like quite a steep. The slope is quite a steep because we build a, a hill from the garbage. So some people call it land hill actually. So unfortunately in the past, many people or many authority allow the surrounding village to use it for pasture or maybe planting something. But since they realize the many countries and many scholars realize that there are lots of like heavy metal chemical things goes to the grasses and you know the poison the plants so not much in use nowadays hard and use 23 as you can see is high like building a shopping mall or things like that which is as i said it is I personally believe it shouldn't be that even after 30 years of the post-closure and restoration stage, because um, the problem is there. And energy generation, this is the new trend because nowadays we need to clean generation. So many countries and authorities take advantage to use it for uh, generate energy, whether the solar panel or wind turbine Wind, wind turbines. And that is a good option too, but need to do some careful construction and engineering work to make sure the capping layer, the final layer of landfill doesn't harm. Open air space is a smart choice. As I said, many authorities and countries enforce the law to do that. 
And as you can see, here is some example. For example, in Tel Aviv, Israel, we have Fresh Park as a great example, which is in New York. It's a well-known example of the redevelopment of a landfill to an open space, and we have in other parts of the world. Why this is a smart choice? Because land actually allocation is a per prominent issue. So by reusing the landfill, we actually reuse a disturbed land, a dead land. And landfill at the same time has environmental issues and create eyesores. And environmental issues remain there for a long time. So when we use a disturbed land, that actually, because land is expensive, we need open space for our community too. And it also includes by by transferring the landfill to an open air space, it increased the rate of success and decreased the rate of failure. For example, if we convert it to buildings, there might be explosion, crack, demolition. So when we convert it to, in, because open air space, park, green air space helps improve the any area actually. So improve landfill quality and prevent from the, pub, for the public from the risk of hazard because some of the plants can actually observe and catch the, the poisonous and it's good for the benefit of public and those who just go to that place. And less technical work and financial investment need for converting a landfill to a open space. So to get a successful redevelopment of a closed landfill site, it is highly recommended by many scholars, included me and government authorities to use, to reuse it for an open space. Here, I was lucky to have to have opportunity to be involved of a redevelopment design project. And one example is the Ayer Hitam Sanitary Landfill. As I said, in Malaysia, I still use the sanitary because a lot of landfill are dump site. So for easier communication, let me call it the Malaysian Landfill. So a little bit information of this, actually, this landfill, Ayer Hitam Sanitary Landfill, was the first sanitary landfill built in Malaysia and it started receiving the waste in 1995 and closed at 2006. It was designed for 20 years, but it closed earlier than that. As you can see, the reason is that the first big mistake was that wrong, wrong sighting and planning because the day they started, there was not many, many residential or people over there. But gradually, as you can see in 2004, so the surrounding is almost occupied by housing areas. So the the landfill design in three phases, as you can see. This phase one completed, but the phase two partially completed, completed, and phase three just left behind. So meaning after, even after they did a lot of construction, isolated the area, gas capturing, everything, all the foundation is there, but government received lots of complaint from the people living nearby. So it's just waste of money and investment because one phase just left behind totally, another one partially just used. And this picture, I would like to take opportunity about this picture, regardless of my topic show, we human beings just destroyed the forest jungle in 1985, it was full of jungle in tropical climate and gradually we just lost them because of the increasing in population. I'm a person that I always encourage to reduce the population because of those problems. Well, after that, 
when we come to design process, of course, is a project. So all the fundamental design consideration, same as other projects, need to be taken into account. But since the landfill is a complex and complicated environment, some, somebody call it dead environment, it is not an original environment. Everything over there is just borrowed from somewhere else. It's an environment built over garbage, trash, and hazardous materials. And even the soil over there is borrowed from there, from somewhere else. So the major factor has to be considered for designing a closed landfill is a gas emission and explosion because always there is a gas emission and it could be explode. Leachate formation, garbage generate leachate long after even it's closed. As I said, maybe up to 30 years. So differential settlement, because as I said, it's not a normal land. So anytime this can happen like that. A stop a stabilization because usually the landfill construction um, is, is quite a steep because they have to put the garbage together, make it cells and water runoff because nothing should damp soil over there because of the ecological capping. And it is important in countries like Malaysia with a huge amount of rain. So this is serious problem when I started designing this landfill. And I call the design project as a landfill to leisure because it was planned to, op to, to be redeveloped to an open space. So as I said, lots of consideration like a slope analysis, the existing and future um, flora and fauna, and then the major <clears throat> drainage direction and minor bond Lots of things taken into consideration with a careful study. And this was the final result of master plan. So I talk about, for example, let me give you some more information like gas emission. So what? You may ask, okay, you know that. So how do you take this one into your design? Which means that as a designer, I shouldn't add any structure or any activities that is against this problem. I mean, against the gas emission. For example, an enclosed building is not suggested. Even for having the public restroom, it is not suggested to have it on top of landfill. It could be maybe a wave in the safest place. Leachate formation, anything that, for example, I shouldn't introduce any water body like water feature, things like that or even I shouldn't propose a plant that have a strong and deep root system that can damage or destroy the cap, the capping system of the landfill. So for water runoff, also a careful consideration. This is just example, a careful consideration how I manage that because the rain is there. So I need to think about it where to send up, um, the drains and how to control that, how that drainage is, um, does not, does not, that does not be against the activities I suggest. So it was just like giving you some small ideas, how difficult and complicated is the design of project and of course a lot a lots of investment a lots of construction work lots of engineering work needs to be done but the question is okay we did all that we provide lots of activities okay and we at least supposed to maintain the area for 30 years what if people don't use it and this happened to this Malaysian landfill. Despite providing 
great, great, great space and good activities for publics. Literally, very few people use the space. In a few years, I visited this this space for even more than, I don't know, more than 50, 60 times in different time of a year, different, different time of a week and different time of a day to see how people use it. In many cases I've been there, nobody except me or maybe if a friend accompanied me. Sometimes one or two and as a as you saw, this is a 100 acres land with quite good activities for people. Unique activity you, can, you could see nowhere else. For example, bird watching, a great area for jogging. But that's why I call it fail to achieve sustainability. So I was curious why is like that? What we could do to prevent the project like that not to be failed. So I come up with the importance of social aspects. And here I would like to share with you, I live in three different countries. So we call it, sometimes we divide countries like developing countries, developed countries. Maybe we sometimes we should call under developing countries like my own countries. Here is the main differences between developing and developed country which in developed, developing country, they don't really consider public opinion, community engagement. The differences is not about on infrastructure and, and technology. In Malaysia, those who have been in Malaysia, at least in certain places, they are not beyond. They are very advanced in many, compared to many developed country. And great example could be United Arab Emirates. They are good in technology, but make it, this is my understanding, my observation living in three different, what's make a country developing and develop or underdeveloping that, as I said, is here. So why people don't use that, don't use this space, didn't use this space, not only here and similar cases, simply people have concern people are still perceive a landfill even after closure, a place of contamination. And this concern even can be greater with the existing problem if we don't do the job perfectly. For example, based on my observation, I categorize the problem in that Malaysian landfill as the air quality, as you can see here, because there is a gas. I have been there, the odor, there was bad smell there water quality because leachate is there and this is leachate lagoon, lagoon. And this is the third, the phase three, I said they just left it behind since they left it behind. So, and, but they did the foundation and everything. So the rainwater remained there and it creates some kind of problem like uh, flies, mosquitoes. Health issue, because as you can see the leachate seepage from the age of the landfill and noise. But even though we have concern, still public, especially those who are living nearby, would be happy when the landfill is closed because it has some benefit for them. It has social benefit, environmental benefit, and economic benefit for them. Yes. So then since I understand this one, I found that I did some more research and I found that community engagement or public participation, it could be a great way to encourage people to be part of the project. And then after that, use their space, you know, and then uh, doesn't allow the, the project to be failed. And according to the International Association of Public Participants, there are different, uh, a stage or way to, in, to, 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 to engage community to any project from just keep them informed to just 
to just take the take a decision based on the community suggestion. And then with further research, I found that if we apply in public preference toward different type of open space, because how we can formulate public participation into the project is in different way. What I found that one of the most more feasible way is that to applying and knowing public prefer preference to our different type of open space. And then that increased the number of public participation and hope finally it could have help the project for a sustainable land for development from a social perspective. And then I conducted a research that testing uh, variables and controlling variables included the concern and perceived benefit, as I said, to see how these variables can affect public preference for different type of open space in the phase one and in phase one, in phase two, to see if knowing and applying public preference can increase the public part, uh, participation in the project, whether they would be willing or not, still unwilling, and what is underlying factor. So I just give you some highlight of my finding and the research. Before I go further, I need to to categorize open space setting based on Malaysian context. This was another, another challenge of mine because there was no uh, systematic classification in Malaysia for that. So I had to do uh, additional research for that. And finally, part of that research become, uh, I published it as a paper and find a gap in the literature review in that regard too. So I'm not going to explain on that. But I found that we can categorize open air space in the major function as a recreation, nature, and sport. And after that, some function and finally open air space settings. Open air space settings, sometimes people call it activities. However, they are not activities, but usually we go to the park doing some activities that actually we are using the open space settings. And when we asked the people, it was the result from each settings and a major type of open space. And slightly people like nature, prefer nature more than recreation and sport. So I also, as I said, wanted to know about the whether community believe that this redeveloped landfill has more benefit for them or they have concern and examine their preference based on that. So as you can see the people now believe that believe believe that the landfill under restoration has more benefit than concern. So that is a good thing. So people know that. So we can do something then. So for example, the benefit they believe that, they believe that environmental benefit is higher and social benefit slightly is lower than that. And in terms of concern, they had more concern about air quality. And I guess it's because of the odor and bad smell. And last is noise because this already under restoration, not much construction and it makes sense. So after we test the relationship between this um, um, perceived benefit with type, different type of open space, those who believe, for example, the social benefit is higher, they believe landfill, the redevelopment landfill bring the social benefits, they significantly response to the recreation type of open space and sport and total. And those who believe that landfill redevelopment bring the more environmental benefits, significantly respond to the nature. Same here, those who have a concern not really significantly respond to any type, but only those who 
for example, had a issue, I mean, they concerned about the health, they said, okay, a sport is a type that they are care about more. And as a total, the concert and perceived benefit, perceived benefit has more significant association with different type of open space. So which means that we can do something. So people there, they are ready to, to be part of that. So that is uh, something that came from my research. And also, I just summarized my study. So I also test pu public participation with different, with preference, that's a major, and also other affecting factors. And when we ask the people they willing to participate, as you can see, the high number of them said yes. And the preference was significantly, has a significant relationship with public participation. So my research shows that if we increase, we apply the public preference or community preference, we could be sure that the number of participation will be increased. Another factor that affected public participation was education. Education here means if they have any familiarity or knowledge about the similar case, a landfill or similar case, similar restoration project, those who say yes, they are willing more to participate. An ethnic group. Malaysia is very unique countries and is very diverse because it consists of Chinese, Malay and Indian. So there are a lots of underlying issues that they never mix. For example, they never married each other. The Chinese don't like to send <clears throat> children to the public ex a school mixed with Malay. And this because over there, the government fully controlled by Malay as a major ethnic group raised there. And unfortunately, they give priority for Malay. For example, some, some, sometimes the foreigner get more benefit from government than local people, Chinese or Indian, because the foreigner are Muslim. So that's a big issue over there. So because of that, for example, Chinese said that they would, they are, they were less interested to participate in that. That is something the Malaysian or any government has to take in account. And to me, what make American great? Because American respect to all minority, underestimated um, races. And because of that, everyone would like to make American great. So that is, a, it was interesting finding my research. And for some recommendation, for example, since we found that the problems, it could be reduce the cancer and increase the perceived benefit, as you can see. Since we can do incre redu reduce the public cancer, we can and increase the perceived benefit. We can we could be sure that more people come to use the space, more people come to like to participate in the project. You know, and we can do that. For example, the concern can be reduced by doing the job perfectly, more perfect. Doesn't allow the, for example, leachate to seepage, reduce the problem of the gas emission. All those engineering things is a just example. We can also change the community experience because experience and education is one as one of those factors that affect people's decision whether to go to the restore landfill or not. For example, we can provide some design facilities. Why not a West Museum, West Gallery, Educational Trash Recycling Center? Everything that we can bring the children, older people, and can educate them not only about the landfill restoration or landfill, educate them about the problem we face for the uh, we problem we have with the trash, with garbage, how to reduce them. Because this is our responsibility to do 
less gen generate less problems. We can providing the event, for example, by having lecture and talks right in the place, right in the place, you know, open space discussion, everything. Or maybe we can have concert, ex expo galleries, maybe the kite flying. This is just some example. Or maybe even camps, bring the student from the school or anywhere else, allow them to, to be there for one year, two year, learn about different, you know, component of landfill. So educational experience is a lot. And we should appreciate sustainability in many ways. Sustainability, not only in environmental ways, but also in the social manners. For example, um, by knowing public preference toward different type of open space, we can reduce concern about landfill, in, increase the perceived benefit about that and change in public experience. Public participation in the development project is to encourage ethnic groups to participate, provide public education and sustainable development means as I said, usually we talk about sustainability, there are three components. Environmental aspects can be improved by technical and engineering solutions. So no, more research on that, more maybe uh, innovation we need to make sure. For example, the, the landfill I show you, the time I took that, captured that pictures, let me go back. So these problems, the, the time I took this picture was early, yeah, yeah, it was late 2017, yeah, it was late 2017 and the landfill was close 2016. Meaning 11 years after that, it, the, you can see the lichet here, seepage from the edge. That's a problem with engineering work. So of course, this not, is not a sustainable way because it poisons the area, the soil. It goes to the surface water. And in Malaysia, the amount of rain is high. So the, when the rain, rain coming, it mixes with the rainwater and then lots of problems. So we can increase, we can do more research in terms of material we use and the method we use to overcome the environmental problems. So economic aspects means by financial resources, maybe we can encourage the private sector to be involved of that by giving some incentive or whatever we can and social aspects which is the administrative support, meaning our government and authorities should fund public for sh should fund um, <clears throat> organization that involve or any NGO groups that are involved in such a West stream industry to, to bring more people, opinion, all those things to achieve sustainability. And after this long journey I have done from design and research, I found a missing link. I found that um, design, I mean, developing and redeveloping a landfill is not all about, is not all about the engineering works. So other disciplines should be part of the project from the beginning of that, from the very earliest stage. That's why here I come up with the idea and publish it as a landscape along with landfill. Here, what I mean is that, because usually after closure and, post, and in the post closure stage, usually they ask landscape architects or similar discipline to come and convert the place to, a, for example, open a space. I found that why not the landscape architecture, architects and similar discipline to be part of 
project from the beginning, which is citing and planning a stage, because I found that, and in my opinion, the landscape architects can play a significant roles to make the place more sustainable if they start from the beginning. For example, in citing and planning a stage, similar discipline like landscape architecture can think about after you consideration, which means once you know what you want to do for the landfill after it's closed, you can give some suggestion and idea how to develop and design that. So they can also think about buffer distance and provide maybe shelter belt to minimize the problem of the landfill to adjust an area. For example, controlling dust, controlling the odor and analyzing flora and fauna. There are lots of ideas in my papers, but I'm just giving you a light. So this is a light up idea. So meaning it has to be more research on that to develop uh, more details. For example, in operation stage, landscape maintenance program can be proposed for the area. Because not when we design, we talk about the landfill, not the area is occupied by garbage. There are certain areas that just leave for maybe the transportation and storage, things like that. So in operation stage, the landscape architect can separation of the storage or useful stuff to be reusing. Reusing not for, I mean, reusing here to building some interesting things for the for the space when we convert it to an open space, meaning any elements, any, yeah, any elements that we want to use, why not we use the waste there, you know, the, the, for example, sometimes you can see in the landfill, you can see the TVs, you know, the fridge, things like that. So those could be an idea how to design based on that. And um, so this is the, the significance um, help of a landscape architect and similar discipline when they to be involved from the beginning. Yes. And another advantage of this idea could be to create a new job, you know, new job for these disciplines. So thank you so much. It was my presentation. I tried to make it as short as possible and as easy to understand. So please, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you, Ashkan, for a fascinating presentation about a topic that I doubt very many of us have even ever thought of. So uh, you've given us some good insights. <clears throat> While we're waiting to see if anyone in the audience has a question, uh, I would be curious to learn more about uh, how and when you came to this particular specialty in landscape architecture. Uh, why not uh, study uh, residential or commercial landscaping or park design? And uh, it, it seems like this is a very narrow field uh, within the, the broader top of, topic of, of landscape architecture. So just maybe what got you interested in, in landfills? Yeah, that is a great question. Actually, I was curious about what, I always believed that landscape architecture is a discipline that can die. This is my, my belief from long time ago. If we, as a landscape architect does not have a solution for the major problem of this world. So we create open space, that's a benefit, but it's not enough. A lot of other disciplines also could do that. And since the, the trend of the global issue is high and the population is increased, landscape architecture should do something, otherwise it's die because we had, we had discipline that like a philosophy. How many people nowadays would like to study philosophy? Not much. 
So that's something that aware me about this issue. And I wanted to do something about the, the issue. And I knew because in my hometown, the landfill was just like a dump site. So beside that, one day, just by a chance, I checked the YouTube and I saw a video and just, I was curious and click on that. A man, I had this video, but maybe there is no time to show that. So a man talking about that at the end of the that was a music to say, I want to do something with my own hand. So that's combination of that things inspired me to go in that specific field. And you are right, it is not very common a landscape architecture goes to that a specific and narrow area. That's why I call it a missing link. We have a question from Sherry, who's asking about the uh, public participation element. So how do you get uh, residents who live near or work near a, a landfill site to participate? Uh, and uh, do you have offered incentives or what kind of invitations do you use to uh, increase the, uh, the number of participants who would come uh, offer their comments? I hope I understand the question correctly. There was no participation in the project. As I said, the project was failed because public didn't participate in the project. And because of that, they didn't use that space. Okay, so the space was fruitless. So my study was to investigate what's the problem and come up, I come up with the idea of the public participation in the project from the planning stage after closure, it's a, it's a solution for that. If Sarah asked, how did I get the public opinion? That's a different story than how I get those data and public opinion. So if Sarah can clarify, I can maybe more answer to this. Iris, your colleague from Extension is wondering, what is your next project? Uh, what do you hope to study uh, as you continue your research in this area? If I want to do research and I hopefully I have time to do that, I'm going to do that, to go through that missing link. And because I just light up the idea, honestly, it was the, I haven't seen this kind, this idea before that giving uh, involving the landscape architects to the waste stream. So quite a general idea I just uh, published. So I need to go more detail on that. For example, I just give an idea in each stage of landfill, how the landscape architects can help, but each stage, each stage alone can can do extensive research on that. For example, in site and planning, just the uh, just the uh, help of the landscape architect to that stage, and of course to other stage as well. Iris, I hope I answered your question. And uh, one final question from um, Matt, who is wondering about uh, if. Uh, there are any international regulations um, for landfill closure, uh, or is it up to countries, uh, or in this country, states? So does it vary widely, or are there some uniform standards? Maybe I'm not aware of those things. As far as I know, usually this, uh, for example, in uh, U.S. is regulation and protection is by EPA, but there are uh, a specific uh, yearly or bi-yearly conferences. For example, I can't remember, unfortunately, the name because it's two, three years. I haven't focused on these things. I forgot and I'm getting old. <laughs> So there is a one in Italy, for example, that bring a scholars and expert specifically focus on landfill topics. 
not only for closure, but I think overall for other things. There are a few type of that, but if talking about organization focusing on closure, I'm not aware of that. Sorry, Matt. I'm afraid we're out of time. And so I, I hope that uh, some of you will follow up individually with our, our speaker with your questions. And uh, I'll put your email into the chat to, before we go. Uh, but I'm wondering if uh, uh, those that are remaining in the audience could turn on your cameras and we could give a virtual round of applause or uh, put up a, a hand in uh, Zoom and uh, thank our uh, speaker for his time and expertise. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you, everybody, from, for joining us today. Uh, remember, next week is spring break. Uh, so if you tune in at 1230 on Tuesday, there will be nothing to see on Zoom. But uh, come back two weeks from today on March 23rd, when our speaker will be Ben Hunter uh, from the University of Idaho Library speaking about the economics of scholarly communication. So uh, thank you again, everybody. Uh, have a great afternoon and a great spring break.